Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you for coming to today's uh, Dean's Lecture. And for those of you who have been here before, you know that these, uh, these lectures are to recognize faculty who are either appointed or promoted to the position of professor in our school. And, uh, and I, as I usually say at these, uh, at these ceremonies, that uh, I'm a cynical person, jaded. I'm not, I don't get excited about much. But to, to be on our faculty is a huge accomplishment. But to be promoted to professor is an incredible accomplishment. And the decision is not made by me or the, uh, the members of the uh, A&P committee or the advisory board. It's really made by peers around the world who we solicit letters from. and have people review the careers and accomplishments of our faculty. And they, they're the ones who make the decision. And so, so um, it's hard enough to convince a committee of something, but to convince uh, peers around the world is really, really difficult. And David Bashai did that in spades. And uh, David has a, I, I think, you know, reviewing his CV is probably the most well-trained faculty member we have. And I'll just tell you, I've, um, it really, his CV really knocked knocked my socks off here. So he went to Harvard undergraduate where he trained in philosophy and physics, right? So, and then he went to UC San Diego, the Harvard of the, uh, of the West, and uh, got his MD degree. Then he went to UCLA and, and did a uh, MPH in population and family health. And then he went to Cedar sinai UCLA, and did a combined meds PEDS residency. Okay, so he's got physics, he's got philosophy, he's got an MD. MPH, medicine residency, PEDS. So then he went to Wharton and he got a PhD in health economics. So uh, incredible. So, you, you know, most of us would have stopped there. Uh, but David had a continuing track record of accomplishment. And, you know, it's funny when you read people's CV, uh, one of the things I uh, realized, I didn't realize about David is I knew that he was always interested in clinical things because at graduation, I guess two years ago, he swabbed my hand before I shook everybody's hand at graduation, before and after. And I had to be careful not, like, not to touch my nose and do all this. And then, you know, he was waiting for me as I came off the stage, so I didn't wash my hand. And he told me later I had no pathogens. Um, but I think we need to redo that. Uh, need to redo that looking for viruses, right? That's that'll be the key thing. But he, incredibly broad interest. And, and within these broad interests, an uh, incredible track record of accomplishment. And uh, as I as related to David, one of the letters that, um, that was written for him, uh, for his promotion, called him the Swiss Army Knife of Public Health. And, <laughs> and, and they went on to, to explain uh, this metaphor in that the Swiss Army Knife does so many things and does each of them well. And, and that really, I thought, capsula, you know, encapsulates David's career. Yeah, so, so David is a professor now in the Department of Population, Family, and Reproductive Health. He has joint appointments in health behavior and society and international health, and as well as in the Department of Pediatrics at the School of Medicine. And I should say, as a clinically active uh, uh, physician, he, he works in an emergency room here in town. Um, David also heads the interdepartmental program in health economics. And as you know, this is an interdepartmental program that has faculty in many of the departments who do health economics and has a combined curriculum and comes together to be a resource for students from across the school. David uses the lens of economics and economic theory to study many things, uh, but, but he also just is really interested in lots of different things. And he's one of those faculty members. I can remember I, I had a nine-hour layover in Egypt, and of course somebody asked me, do you know David Bishai? Uh, and uh, you know when I uh, found out I was at the school, and David works there with faculty uh, through the Gates Institute, but it works uh, around the world, and I think he's going to talk about that uh, a little bit. Um, David is a is a mentor, uh, a collaborator, and as a health economist, you know those of you who are there, I see John Bridges in in the back. You know that it's like being a biostatistician. It's a it's a set of tools, a methodology that lots of people demand that you can bring and collaborate with people. But it only works when you collaborate well. So, so, uh, so I'm really happy to have David here today, and, and to recognize his family and the support they've given him in, in coming here to this point. And uh, we look forward to hearing about the revolution. So, David Bashai. Thank you, Mike, and thank you all for for coming. Um, 
I, uh, I'm really grateful to all of you for, for not just being here today, but for being here for, for many, many years. I'm, I'm going to read a quote from Johns Hopkins Magazine today. There's an interview with Sam Palmasano, the, the CEO of, of uh, IBM and one of our alums, and he was talking about his time at Hopkins, and this really resonated with me. He says, you know what I realized at Hopkins? That there are a lot of really smart people, and you need to get them to work with you. Because if you can get all these smart people to work with you and you don't take credit for their work, you might be successful, even if you're not the smartest one there. And I felt that that, that really represents what I got out of, out of the, the, the 16 years I've been on the faculty. I've been able to really work with, a, with some really tremendous colleagues, and I'm really grateful to all of you. I'm also grateful to my family sitting here in the front row for putting up with me. Jessica and Annie and my mother Elizabeth are here to, to get sympathy from you, and I hope you give them plenty. Um, <laughs> So, wanted to launch into the, the topic today. The title of the talk is Hygiene is the Revolution Over, and that's going to be the, the trajectory of the talk. We're going to talk about what hygiene is, what the revolution was, the hygiene revolution, and then ask the question, is it over? And we'll come to some conclusions about that. Um, so let me talk first about hygiene and, and, of course, the hygiene revolution. And this arc represents Sweden uh, and its trajectory. You're seeing life expectancy at birth on the vertical axis and their economic growth on the horizontal axis. And you can see that Sweden started uh, in 1800 as a very poor country with only $1,000 per capita and a life expectancy of about 32 years. And then over the, the century, from 1800 to 1900, they gained about 20 years of life expectancy without getting a whole lot richer. And then as their economy improved some more, they gained another 20 years of life expectancy. By 1950, they had a life expectancy of, of 70 years. And the last 60 years of Swedish life has been this last little bit of 10 years life extension. And so now in, in Sweden, the average life expectancy is 81 years. The revolution really happened at the beginning of this trajectory, wouldn't we agree, that it's the beginning, that first 100 or 150 years where a lot of amazing things happen. Whatever moved Sweden's life expectancy up this vertical axis, that saved lives millions at a time. And that's what really attracted me to, to a lot of the work that I've been doing over the past few years. Part of why I became a health economist was to figure out how countries do this and how I could help them do it faster. So the talk today is going to be a bit like a whodunit, like a mystery novel. There are traditionally several suspects for what created this hygiene revolution. There's hygiene itself, and we'll talk about what that word means and, and what our role is in hygiene. And then, of course, we need to give space for other contenders. The scientific revolution occurred at this time. What did that have to do with it? And of course, tremendous progress in the, the, the science of medicine. And of course, economic growth at the very bottom of the axis, constantly drumming away and improving uh, uh, prosperity that could be spent on, on a lot of things. So we're going to take these in order. First, hygiene, then science, medicine, and economic growth. Let's talk about this word, this crazy old word, hygiene, that used to be in the name of our school. What is that word? Well, hygiene is named after this beautiful woman up at the top, named the goddess Hygieia. If you got, if you're here early enough, you saw the quiz. And Hygieia um, was worshipped, but not a lot. No one really ever prayed to Hygieia. They prayed to her father, Asclepius. We got that word. The, the German Institutes of Health in the 19th century named their institutes Institutes of Hygiene in honor of Hygieia. And what they taught at those German institutes was the art and science of maintaining the health of populations. And so when William Welch came back from Germany and got the idea for founding our school, he liked that idea. And he thought that we would be a scientific institute for the art and science uh, of maintaining the health of populations. Um, but as you probably know, we took the word hygiene out of the name of our school, and now there's only so many words that you could put in the name of a school, and we took out hygiene and we put in Bloomberg. And <laughs> there's, there's actually some wisdom to that because, you know, from, I've been thinking about this a lot. And we took out a goddess, but we put in a demigod, and uh, Bloomberg is a demigod. And, <laughs> To, to Bloomberg, a population actually has a very nice connotation to me. This mayor is saying, it is my job to be the one in charge of whether my population is healthy. 
he is the last in a long line of, of politicians and political theorists who say, my job is the health and well-being of the people in, in my town. And here he's really channeling uh, a predecessor from the Enlightenment, Jeremy Bentham. And Jeremy, I like, because he's an economist. Jeremy Bentham was one of the starting uh, expounders of utilitarianism and the idea that we should measure quantitatively whether the government is doing good policies or bad policies. And how do we know? We measure quality adjusted life years or utils or dallies. And we keep quantitative calculus of whether our government is doing the right thing. And so Jeremy Bentham began this idea in the Enlightenment at the beginning of the 19th century. And he had a very famous student, famous in public health circles, named Edwin Chadwick. Edwin was responsible for a whole lot of business in the 19th century that gave rise to, to the sanitary idea and the hygiene revolution. Uh, let me just fast forward to that, because Chadwick was writing his report on the sanitary condition of the laboring classes of, of, of Great Britain in the middle of the, the 19th century, he published this in the year 1842. And this cartoon occurred about 12 years later in Punch magazine. The monster coming out of the, the water is the, the Thames. And the Thames smelled awful in the middle of the, the, the 19th century. What had happened was um, they were making a transition. Of course, lots of rapid urbanization, population growth in the city to, to man the factories in London. Um, but they all had to put their excrement somewhere. And they were making a move towards the flush toilet. They, the flush toilet was something that you could afford finally. But all of those flushes went down to the river and they actually emptied very close to uh, the Houses of Parliament in Big Ben. That all culminated according to this mythic history that we have of the, the founding of our discipline. The great stink of 1858 led to tremendous reforms. And some of the reforms that I wanted to alert you to of course, were the Public Health Act, uh, which actually put on the books of England the idea that there should be local health boards, that government actually should be in charge of making sure the populations of our cities were healthy, followed by the Sanitary Act, where maintaining local sewers and water and street cleaning, again, was a civic responsibility. Now, these reforms in the middle of the 19th century really didn't get enacted because they cost money. And the ratepayers of England really not excited about paying for new sewers, and they didn't. And in fact, their own children were dying of diarrhea and dysentery because their rich uh, factory-owning uh, parents just felt this wasn't a wise investment. Well, in 1867, the political winds changed in England. Uh, Simon Schreder has a great piece on the, the deep politics of what went on, but it turned out that England had to give the right to vote to middle-class men. Before 1867, you had to be pretty rich to get to vote. Now, in 1867, to keep the, the, the forces from making massive uh, claims, um, uh, the, the, the enfranchisement of, of middle class, the working class, led to the concessions that finally built the sewers and, and actually paid for the public health measures that were, were required by the health officers. 1875, they got a brand new Medical uh, Officer Act, the Public Health Act of 1875, so now those local health boards are staffed by medical officers. Schools began to spring up around England to train this new workforce to be a medical officer because going to medical school or getting medical apprenticeships didn't teach you this new science of epidemiology that was required to be a medical officer. And our field was born. It was born in the 19th century. Other acts followed. Um, and this really was really what I think of when I want to use the word hygiene. I don't want to get stuck thinking of hygiene as soap, water, clean hands, it's so much more than that. It's really about the institutions that we, I'm sorry, I'm going backwards, let me go forward. Let me go forward again. Here, forward. It's about the institutions um, that support all this. So nowadays, when we talk about public health, the CDC has given us a language to use and they've developed a list of the essential public health functions. There's 10 of them in the US. Other countries have decided there are more than 10. And really, when we talk about public health and what we think of as the, this hygiene uh, endeavor, 
we need to be thinking about monitoring the health status of populations using surveillance, diagnosing outbreaks using outbreak investigation and shoe leather epidemiology. Of course, there's this uh, action loop where once you find an epidemic, you inform, educate, and empower the people in your community, mobilize community partnerships with the people at your side, uh, using policy development in order to take action against those threats to health that you identify. There is a law enforcement function that is part of hygiene. Many local public health acts give uh, legal authority to the health officer to shut down offending businesses and, and practices. This seventh one is something that often crowds out typical hygiene work. This is administering medical care services to the poor and needy, these community health centers. It is part of public health, linking people to their needed personal health services. It's part of, of the practice of public health. Finally, there's imp making sure that the public health and personal health care workforce is replicated, making sure that they're of high quality, and conducting research. So we, of course, participate in many of these essential public health functions. But part of the idea that dates back to Bentham and Chadwick and the hygiene revolution is that this is uh, something that both uh, civil society and government have to participate in. Let me uh, show you back a blast from the past. A hundred years after the British were developing their hygiene revolution, we were in on it too here in Baltimore. And I'm about to show you a clip from uh, the I Eastern Baltimore to Health to District. By my school and the city health department. The old familiar combination of teaching and doing. And so is epidemic control. The course started with a study of the famous outbreak of cholera in London back in 1854. It was the first epidemic that had been scientifically tracked down street after street by the corpses that had left in its deadly wake. Mike learned to chart the movement of infection. A lesson that proved useful sooner than he expected. For in October, the maps of the Eastern Health District began to bristle with disease. Health officers and epidemiology professors recognized an abnormal increase in diphtheria. Every day, more cases were rushed to the city hospital for contagious diseases. The entire district was threatened. A district where thousands of children were living in overcrowded homes that invited the spread of infection. The call went out for volunteers to help fight the threat of an epidemic. Some of the students at the School of Hygiene and Public Health answered the call. And Mike was among them. To him, diphtheria had a special significance. But this wasn't London in 1854. Something could be done to stop the ride of death this time. Science has learned to make war on epidemics. The meeting in the Little District Health Office was very much like a military staff meeting, where a campaign is planned and strategy is worked out. The mobilization call was posted everywhere. Diphtheria threatens you. Come to the district clinic for your toxoid. So that clip um, comes from here where we were the civil society group supporting the health district. The Eastern Health District was a co cooperation between our school and the city health department. This clip from 18, uh, 1947, it's also interesting because this was the Hopkins 24-7 of the 1940s. This was the Hollywood producers trying to start a salvo in the Cold War saying, look at us, look what we do in health and medicine. They didn't take pictures of the ER. They took pictures of Hopkins School of Public Health. This was the show. Because why, in 1947, we were the major thing that people thought was fighting disease. So our collaboration was the big star of this moment in the hygiene revolution. And it was this institutionalization of the activities of public health by, by both civil society and, and health districts that was critical. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about theory. I am an economist, and you're not going to escape. You're going to have to get some economics. And so here comes uh, some economics. It's economics that I think you'll find helpful. When we think about something like the hygiene revolution, we invoke what we call a health production function. And it's equations on the, on the board. You don't have to run out of the room screaming. What I'm saying is that health on the left-hand side of the equation, this is health of the i person in the j community 
has two influencing factors. Inputs by the government of that place, called Z, and in inputs by the household of that person, called X sub I sub J. So those two things are both things that help improve the health of that person. They are transformed as a factory transforms, you know, we transform water and carbon dioxide and, and sugar into Coca-Cola. Here we transform these government health inputs and private health puts inputs into health. So that's pretty simple, pretty straightforward. I'm going to kick it up a little bit with uh, a little wrinkle on this that was published by Joel Mokier in the American Economic Review in 1997. Joel says it's not just Z and X. There's actually a, a, a quality function that the government actually can do a good thing with its Z or it can do a not so helpful thing. So that government health function depends upon what is the best available public health technology in that area. Have they been able to access the very latest systematic reviews of the best way to sanitize the water and kill rats? Are they with the program in what is the best available? And have the scientists been able to push the envelope on the best practices? As we push the envelope in B, the governments have access to better practices. Then there's this gap factor. It's the, the slippage between what is known about how to be a good government health agency and what is actually practiced. And the bigger phi is, the worse the government's expenditure is. So if we have big gaps, even great scientists aren't going to make a big difference. Now the similar parallel process is happening over at the, the household. Household has access to the very best Johns Hopkins trained medical science or not. And as that doctor, and we all want our doctors to have the very best A they can possibly have, that's why we go doctor shopping. And then we, when we get that best available health technology, we have to do our part and keep our gap low. We may be able to do what the doctor says, exercise and take our pills and so on, using the best available. So this is actually a very useful for me. It's useful in, in structuring my research today. I will be estimating a public health production function. I will be looking at the health of a population and seeing how it changes as we change uh, Z and X. And certainly when we think about what we do in research, we probably spent a lot of our time thinking about things on the board. We want, of course, Z to be big. We want governments to spend a lot on public health. And we want X to be big. We want Affordable Care Act to give more money to personal health services, I think. We don't want less money. And then we want there to be small gaps. We want people to do what their doctor says. And we want governments to do the best available practices. In fact, part of what drew me into my profession was a, a real desire to make Epsilon small and Phi small. Because I could see Sweden being 80-year life expectancy using the same B and the same A that's available in Malawi. And the only thing keeping Malawi out of the show is either a small X, a small Z, or big gaps. And a lot of it is big gaps. Why? Because Sweden was really poor during its hygiene revolution. You don't need a lot of money to get a long way. You just need small gaps. And so part of our, my research agenda is to say, what is it that can make your gap small? And part of my insight is, it's not just knowledge, of course. It's that institutionalization, those local health departments like we had here at the Eastern Health District with civil society partners that really made the difference for us um, back in the day. Is that possible? Now, I, that's a hypothesis, not a fact. What I'll be doing later in this hour is trying to show you estimates that, that try to test that idea. So that's the end of our theory, but it's going to be directing what we do uh, uh, with the, the rest of the talk. All right, so when, one other thing that I'd like to say about uh, uh, this health production function is, is uh, summarized by this three-dimensional graph. In this dimension, I'm plotting the public inputs. And I believe that you this surface goes up much higher as you move your public inputs along. And you can see the elevation going faster as we move to the left. The private inputs moving here to the right, I say they're effective. You're, it's important to have private inputs into health. But I just I have a gut feeling and a, and a hypothesis that the productivity of those private inputs isn't as strong. And I'll tell you what informs this. It's, it's the, the, coming from gardening and from farming. 
100 years ago, when we were trying to make our populations of uh, sheep and goats and cows healthy, we didn't make them healthy one at a time. No farmer does that. You give them clean water, and you build a nice fence, and you make sure they have got plenty of great food, and your herd of cattle is healthy. And our ancestors running the hygiene revolution, they came from farm backgrounds, and, and they got that. Here we are divorced from agricultural areas, and we end up thinking about the individualized approach. And, and it, I, I'm saying it's effective, and you can see the, the slide shows that you can climb the surface both moving to the left and moving to the right. But it seems to me that it's much more effective as you climb to the, to the left and move those public inputs. You can ascend that slope much more rapidly with public inputs. Again, a hypothesis. I'm not stating what I've proven, I'm stating what I would like to prove. Now, there's one obvious thing that, that I've had the, the fortune to work with colleagues here at Hopkins that, that I'm going to share with you, that if this surface is just how healthy is the population, I think, but I'm not sure, that public health does a better job of that than, than medical care. But I've been able to show that if this surface is not health itself, but disparities in health, I'm very confident that public health lowers health disparities much more effectively than personal services. Letting individuals take care of themselves one by one actually can widen disparities. But letting government give them common uh, investments in their health will narrow disparities. Let me show you the work that I've done on this topic uh, with the great colleagues. This is a paper that I did with uh, Michael Koenig, uh, who passed away about three years ago, and uh, Mehrab Ali Khan from ICDDRB. We looked at measles vaccination and its effect on health disparities. And what we found was that in the untreated areas of Bangladesh that had not gotten measles vaccine, the the child mortality death rate ratio, the ratio of infant mortality, under five mortality in the, the richest compared to the poorest, was about a two to one ratio in the unvaccinated. In the vaccinated cohorts, in the early introduction of measles vaccine, that had lowered to about 1.4. And this was significant in all the ways we tried to, to run it, sh showing to us that, yes, public health interventions do narrow disparities. Um, we were so having such a great time with this, we got Keith West and Joanne Katz to come along with us, and they brought in Hugh Waters, Samir Kumar, Sabarna Khatri with us, and we got to look at the same type of thing for vitamin A supplementation. Again, we're looking at health disparities from, from a public health approach where the vitamin A is delivered door to door. It's not, here it is in the clinic, come and get it if you look sick, it's we're going to go and, and give it to you using this public health approach. And so what we found was in the placebo-treated arm of the Sarlahi vitamin A NIPS trial, the rate ratio of death per 1,000 uh, children was 27 among girls and 19 among boys. And yet when they were treated with the vitamin A, the death rate got better for both, but it got a lot better for girls. In fact, vitamin A almost completely eliminated the gender penalty that girls suffer. It was like giving them a penis to give them vitamin A. Uh, which was something a lot easier to do than giving them a penis. So um, vitamin A and the public health approach to vitamin A can lower disparities. We looked at the Filipino approach. When the Philippines uh, decided to s distribute vitamin A, they didn't go door-to-door -to -door like Nepal. They put it in the clinics and said to the doctors, if some sick kid comes to you and they look like they need vitamin A, give them vitamin A no impact on the, the disparities in, in health in the Philippines. It was the public health approach that had the impact. So let's go back to our whodunit show. We talked about hygiene. I'm putting forth as a hypothesis that hygiene gets a lot of credit. But there are other contenders, and they will get credit too, but just not as much. Um, let's first talk about science. Here is one of my favorite pictures of Jonas Salk holding up the solution to America's trouble. He's invented a polio vaccine. He's going to go and save lives millions at a time. And he, he has saved lives with his polio vaccine. Um, now, how do we study things like this? How do we study the impact of scientific innovation on the health of a population? Well, we use the interrupted time series method. You basically draw an arrow on a time series and say, look. So here I've drawn an arrow. And the arrow is pointing at the year 1918 in the United Kingdom's time series. And 
I'm pretty much done convincing you that something happened bad in 1918 in the UK. And I think most of you know what that thing was. And we're basically done. I mean, why even bother doing the statistics now? I can do them. But the interrupted time series approach to proving that the flu pandemic was an important detriment to health in 1918 is pretty much done. So drawing arrows on a time series is really about all there is. Now, there is, you know, give me the data and we can start running our, our models on it, but sometimes it really isn't that persuasive. And let me show you the CDC version of the history of public health. This was a, a major uh, issue of uh, the MMWR in 1999, celebrating a century of public health uh, innovation. And so the CDC drew all of these arrows on the U.S. Uh, uh, crude death rate. And tell me how persuaded you are that the first continuous chlorine water was a major change in the slope of this decline. Uh, we saw the flu pandemic. Let's talk about the elimination of plague. Was that a major change in the decline? Here's the first use of penicillin in 1940. Was that a major shift in the trajectory of decline? We got Sock with his vaccine. We released it on the American people. And are you convinced yet? Did these arrows really hold it for you? No. Drawing ar these arrows of these scientific innovations and saying, look what happened to US uh, health um, didn't work. Now, let me be fair. Here, this little blip right there is 1937. And some of our, my colleagues in uh, economics have written how that blip was actually uh, the sulfa drug introduction. Sulfas were released in 1937. And they did a time series analysis that they claim proves that that release of sulfa actually led to a major change in the slope of the curve. Bad news was that there was a pneumonia epidemic uh, that same year in 1937 in Wyoming and Colorado and Utah, that very same year. And recovering from that epidemic has been a major challenge to that analysis. They're really having trouble proving that that blip was really attributable to, to the, the, the release of sulfa. Um, so this is the kind of work that one would have to do to try to persuade you all that science was part of the major change in, in the, the decline of disease. It certainly played a role. Now, um, I took a historian's lens to this uh, about 10 years ago when I looked at the history of food fortification in the United States. I was trying to draw lessons that I thought I could share with people working in, in low and middle income countries. What I found in our history was long time lags, the kind that you're all familiar with, where the scientist is, discovers something and then has to wait many, many years before it gets implemented. And that was what I, what I ran into when I looked at food fortification. Here's our friend Louis Pasteur, and he, of course, is in the pantheon as a, an incredible scientist for, for making his contributions to germ theory. But again, you're not going to be able to identify that using the interrupted time series technique. Part of that march of science story that is very congenial to lay people and members of Congress says that it was the march of science that made us healthy today. It was John Snow discovering that cholera was waterborne. Well, John Snow didn't even know that cholera was a microbe. They didn't have germ theory. He did certainly contribute to our understanding that it was waterborne, but you're not going to see major changes until the hygiene movement got rolling and started to change how they eliminated human waste. You're not going to be seeing an interruption in the time series that was related to Pasteur's publication of fermentation. Our own Elmer McCollum uh, was leading nutritionist who discovered that rickets was actually a nutritional disease and that cod liver oil could be uh, a preventive. And again, we didn't get over around to, to fortifying our food uh, using McCollum science for, for over 20 years. Maureen and Kimdall discovering that uh, iodine was preventive of goiter in a, a cohort of Michigan school children. We didn't get around to fortifying salt with iodine, and many populations still today can't fortify uh, their, their food with, with micronutrients. Along the line, the scientists show up and they make great improvements in these B terms and A terms, but that implementation gap defeats us. That, that institutionalization just isn't there, and um, we have to end up waiting. 
So this is a, a picture uh, from Michelle Geis, one of my colleagues on, on work looking at uh, social franchises. And here's a, a public health agent who is the implementer. We need people like this to, to get science to actually have an impact. How about medicine? Um, certainly, uh, one would think that medical care has made great strides throughout uh, this hygiene revolution period. And this has been an area of research for, for over 30 years. The first uh, entrant to this literature was, of course, Thomas McEwen, whose publication um, really hinged on lots of charts and graphs that looked a lot like this, where we draw the time series, we draw the arrow, and we say, look, not a whole lot happened. So here is uh, the Massachusetts version. When McEwen wrote his book, he wrote the same data for, um, for, for the United Kingdom. But here's pulmonary tuberculosis deaths in Massachusetts. At a high, it was 400 deaths per 100,000, a major contributor to death in, in Massachusetts. Here is the discovery uh, of the, the microbial foundation, Cox discovering the tubercle bacillus in 1882, really not going to see a whole lot happen to the time series. And finally, when the doctors show up and say, we've discovered a cure for tuberculosis, here it is in the 1950s, by then, tuberculosis is pretty much history. And so this was McEwen's first statement that, he believed that a lot of the mortality decline was led by tuberculosis, and he really couldn't support the, the thesis that medical care was, was a, a, a principal determinant. Now, we can't throw the baby out with the bathwater, because medical care and personal health services do do some things. And certainly, in the last part of the, the, the 20th century, there's clear evidence using interrupted time series methods that medical care has been effective. So here are American men. Uh, you can see their survival after age 65 in blue, and you can see the year. I'm drawing that arrow and saying, look at 1966. Something amazing happened then. Now, you might say it was the war on tobacco, but it really wasn't. You're not going to see smoking rates start to change right in 1966. What happened in 1966 in this country? Medicare. Medicare. So we, we now have better access to personal health care services for these 65 and over men. And you can see their survival begin to turn a corner right there. And we can identify this statistically. So medical care gets a win on improving our survival from, from coronary disease. But medical care has sort of crowded out. And I'll be showing you in a few minutes some of the data that I think you're familiar with on how our budgets keep going up and up and up for medical care. Even though we got our life expectancies up to the 70s, before medical care had its antibiotics, um, that capture of the public consciousness and the public budget is something that medical care is, is, is guilty of. And why they capture us, we all, we all come into this building, we think about it, look at those people across the street, they got cranes and bulldozers and more money than, uh, than anybody. Why don't we have that? Well, you know, there's a quote by James Joyce that I'm flashing on the screen. He says that the advantage of medicine is the ineluctable modality of the visible. I'm using Joyce to say that. The ineluctable, ineluctable means unescapable. You can't get away from it. Modal means it is the mode. It's something modal. And when you can see something with your eyes, it becomes the mode. It becomes the thing you think of when you think of health. And so when we think of health, we think of the healers that we've seen and encountered in our life. We've been to the doctor. We know that they can make us better. And their visibility crowds out our ability to think about hygiene and, and public health. So let's go on. The last contender for today is economic growth. Economic growth has been on this horizontal axis the whole time. My theory says you can't create health out of nothing. You have to allocate resources to it. And economic growth is going to give you resources that you can spend on health. So let's look at that. When we first started to get some industrial growth in our countries, in Baltimore, in London, Paris, our streets began to look like this. And this was a typical street. This was probably Pratt Street. Um, as we urbanized and created an industrial revolution, we created incredibly unhealthy environments, and people couldn't take it. And that the great stink was one of many stinks that there were. And I'm sure this place didn't smell too good either um, 150 years ago. 
So um, the mortality data reflects some of that problem. Here is the United Kingdom mortality series. And I want to run time for you. Here they are in 1800 with a GDP of about $2,000 per capita adjusted for inflation, life expectancy of 40. They got their GDP almost doubled by the year 1870, and they didn't get any extra health. So here they are getting rich but not getting healthy. And, and Simon Schredder, uh, another historian I've been referring to, points this out. So you can get a lot of economic growth, but if you don't spend it the right way, you don't get healthy. And it really wasn't until the latter part of the 19th century when those local health officers began to actually get the budgets to work the way they wanted that we began to invest in the things that, that made the people of England healthier. So money alone won't create health. You have to allocate the money uh, in the proper way. Um, when I was in grad school back in the 90s, I began to try to do the statistical version of this, looking at a long infant mortality time series and a long GDP time series. And we, I had access to data from the United Kingdom and Sweden and the US. And I asked the question the way an economist would, is there a long-term uh, uh, equilibrium between the level of, of economic growth and the level of mortality decline? Now, when economists do this, they know that you just can't do a regression of one time series on another. That's really, really statistically inappropriate. What we use is a method called co-integration. And the sense of co-integration is, is there an equilibrium with one time series and another? The best example I can think of is, we think theoretically that the price of a British pound in New York City is going to have some long-term relationship with the price of a dollar in London. You're not going to see the price of dollars go up, 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 and have no impact on the price of British sterling in New York. People will move money around. And you move one, you're going to move the other. There's a long-term connection between those two things. And you can run a time series analysis called a co-integration analysis uh, to ask the question, is there a long-run equilibrium between two time series? Now, back in the 90s, I published this in the, the journal Health Economics. At the time, I said, you know what, maybe I'm doing it wrong. I couldn't find a relationship except for 19th century Sweden. So 19th century Sweden, 1867 to 1909, I did find evidence of an equilibrium relationship between GDP growth and mortality decline. But I didn't find it for Sweden later in the 20th century, nothing in the UK, nothing in the UK, nothing in the US. And I published that, and not much happened. But over time, the profession of health economics has come to, to really suspect that there really isn't anything you can expect will happen over time, that just money in a time series isn't going to make a population richer. And there are many reasons for it. I was uh, fortunate enough to work with one of our uh, alumni, two of our alumni, three of our alumni, Asma Prashant and Abdul uh, Ghaffar, on a study of uh, one reason why you won't expect there to be a long-term equilibrium. What we find, and others have found as well, is that when a country grows, we have, again, growth on the horizontal axis and uh, the number of road deaths in countries uh, around the world. This is from 95 to 2000. And you can see the inverted U shape, that as countries get richer and richer, they die more and more of car crashes. To get richer, you have to move stuff around your country. You have to drive it around in a truck or a motor scooter. And the more you get money and move it around, the more you crash. And the more you crash, the more you die. Until about the middle of the curve, at around $10,000 per capita, the dying kind of peters out. And you begin to invest in safer roads and streets and better trauma care facilities and so on. And there's an opposite relationship. So just saying it's always money isn't correct. Now, as I said, the profession is catching up. And one of the, the big stars in this area now is Christopher Room. And really, it's, it's accepted throughout uh, health economics that recessions are actually good for health. And here is Room's evidence showing this. Um, when he's taken out the, the trend in uh, recessions, he's got our unemployment rate down at the bottom. We see at the start of the series, low unemployment, high mortality in the US. As the economy gets better and heats up, mortality, the unemployment rate goes, uh, goes up, the mortality goes in the opposite direction. So Room didn't just draw the graph, he did the, the econometric regressions and really convinced a lot of people. People have come back and re-estimated this for Canada, for Germany, for Japan, and for rich countries it appears to be the case that 
Having money is good for health. Spending money is good for health. But getting more money, heating up your economy, is bad for health. And it's bad not just for car crashes. It seems to be related to higher rates of, of cardiac death and stroke death, as well as infant mortality. And um, I'm working t today with Ching Fung and, and Sai Ma on Again, revisiting that connection for infant mortality uh, in the last 10 years to see if that still holds. So it's not just the economy. You have to spend your economic resources in the right way. So I've got about 10 minutes left. I want to begin to answer the question about whether the revolution's over. Now, we're going to be looking at the US and seeing, asking the question, does spending on public health have any connection with better health in the US? So let's revisit what I think most of you know, that healthcare spending in the US is out of control. We see here uh, on the vertical axis, per capita health spending from 1960, where we're spending very little, maybe about $100 on, on our healthcare. My mom shared with me the, the bill for my birth down at the Washington Adventist Hospital. I was born for about $50 um, in 1961. I was a bargain mom, wouldn't you agree? Best money you ever spent. Um, glad you did. Um, but we're spending a whole lot more these days. And we're up to the blue curve, up above um, uh, $6,000 per person. The red curve is the cost of just insurance. It's what you have to pay the people who live in Hartford, Connecticut to process all of our claims and fight with your doctor about whether they're going to pay. That's the red wedge. And then to this green wedge is public health spending. We are spending a little bit more on public health, but not a, a lot per capita. That's a, less than $50 per American per year spent on all of, of public health. Let me break up that last green wedge and show it to you to, so you see it's mostly state and local budgets. The blue is the federal spending on public health, amounting to about $10 billion for the country. And then the red is what states and counties decide that they should spend on, on public health. Now, the state sends block grants. The CDC sends our states and our cities and counties some block grants. And they spend about $6.2 uh, $6 billion on block grants. But I want you to look at what the CDC money goes for. When uh, the, the city of Baltimore or Maryland starts asking for money, they'll spend about half of that CDC fund on the Vaccines for Children project. So more than half of public health money going to subsidize um, vaccines. Um, public health preparedness now, of course, since 9-11 has been a big item that the CDC is doling out. HIV AIDS, mostly therapeutic programs, some prevention, and then cancer, and then you get lost in the rest of it. Tiny little bits of CDC money being spent on, on other things. So the states and, and local governments top this off by about $9 for every one of federal money that they get in order to, to do their work in public health. So I'm going to take a look at this local health spending, and I was able to get one of our undergrads, Sam Shapiro, to put in this data that we got from, from the states on health spending. I'm, you don't have to read every line here. I'm just showing you that I had every state every year from 1980 to, to 2007. So I know what every state was spending on public health over time. I'm going to need to look at my dependent variable, which is going to be infant mortality for every state over time. I'm going to separate infant mortality for, for blacks and whites in order to get the, the job done. You can see District of Columbia standing out as an outlier, representing some of the problems that the African American population has in infant mortality. So when you're doing a regression like this, you have to worry about some statistical problems. Um, there's endogeneity and fixed effects bias. And so my estimator has to control for these two problems. I don't have, this is not an economics audience, but you realize that there are statistical hurdles. And I'm going to do two estimators. The one on the left is the fixed effects estimator that only is looking at the within state difference in spending and, and, and health. And I'm going to have to control for things that I know are going to be confounding the relationship. States spend money on their state hospitals. Just to run a state-owned and operated hospital is part of what they spend money on. That could have some uh, confounding. And I need to control for, for Medicaid spending by each state. And I'll have year effects because I know there are some, some trends and uh, a constant. I don't have a lot of, of degrees of freedom here. I have, um, I have 51 states and, oops. 
I have 51 states and uh, 1,300 observations. Now, my estimates on the effect of, of public health spending are significant in the fixed effects estimate, but as an economist, I'm worried that there's backward reverse causation. Something could be causing that spending, and so I use an instrumental variables approach. We call this an Ariano bond estimator, which uses instruments. And talk to me after, we'll go through the details of that estimator. But what I'm finding is that the, here in the US, spending money on public health between 1980 and 2006 still does appear to lower infant mortality. Um, it, so does spending money on Medicaid. Now, we are spending about $1,000 per person per year on Medicaid, um, and we're only spending $50 per person per year on public health. So if you really do the math, you'll find that an extra dollar spent on public health is lots more, uh, has more productivity for lowering infant mortality than uh, spending on Medicaid. Now, I think this is real. I'm still torturing the data. Um, there's still work to be done here. Um, Medicaid, of course, is going to pay for access to the, those great developments in surfactant therapy and neonatal care, better obstetrical care, but the public health spending also has great impact on back to sleep and SIDS prevention. It has impact on getting kids in car seats. So there's reasons to think that this could be real, but again, it's preliminary and I need to present this this summer at the, the uh, Society of, of Health Economics. Others have found the same result. Glenn Mays published this in Health Affairs in 2011. Just look at the top row. Uh, a 10% increase in spending at the county level on public health is associated with a, a negative 6.85% reduction uh, in infant deaths, also reduces heart disease, diabetes, and cancer. So it looks like public health still has some, some life left in it as a viable way to improve the health of populations. Working on the agenda globally. I've been fortunate enough to work with the Future Health Systems Group uh, with International Health, and we're moving my thinking into whether or not public health has any, any uh, life left in it or life to get started in it in low-income countries. Here's Mozambique, and certainly Mozambique is today where Sweden was when it started its hygiene revolution. The GDP per capita today in Mozambique is about $900 per capita, now they've been able to, they could climb faster at the start of 1950 to 1960. They were climbing really fast, but they've got an AIDS epidemic now and they're slowed down. And the question is, and it's just a question, would investments in essential public health functions speed them up in, in Mozambique? Another country where, where I'm beginning work is in Botswana, where they actually were, have a very distracted public health system. Their district health management teams have been dual tasked, like so many are, with both doing public health and doing all of the essential public health functions. And when you have to do both, you don't do the public health. You just do the clinic. Um, and so you can see them, even before the AIDS epidemic, they were cr crossing over the Swedes. They had been outpacing the Swedes at the start, but then they sort of lost momentum because they didn't have their act together on public health. And of course, the rest of it, the last part since the 90s, has been the AIDS epidemic. But don't you think that AIDS is a public health responsive disease? Don't you think there's something that a health officer can do? Um, I, I hope so. I think so. Um, now, we have to, if we're going to do this, we'd better look at the giants. We'd better look at China and India. Just quickly, let's look at India. Um, India started, like so many countries, going faster than Sweden ever did, up from 1950 to 1980. They made it to 60 faster than Sweden ever did. You can see that blue curve rapidly ascending. And yet India, on a log scale, has actually slowed down, and they're going slower now than, uh, than Sweden was when it was that same uh, stage of economic growth. China is interesting as well. China also had its speedy days back in the 60s and 70s, uh, going faster than Sweden ever did, but since the 80s, they've slowed down, and they're not going as fast as Sweden could when Sweden was as poor as China is now. So Sweden was doing this with the hygiene revolution. There's evidence that China and India are not practicing the public health idea of setting up institutions with local health officers to do surveillance and monitoring community and so on, not happening. And uh, we're starting our research agenda to begin work on, on measurement of this area. 
So local health department generally missing from the revolution in low and middle income countries today. Unfortunately for them, they've been captured by the visible, by medical care, and they're devoting their health budgets into doctors. And Alma Ata didn't help them. If you read Alma Ata, it's about primary health care, not about public health. It's in there, it's in the fine print, but it's not what countries thought to do as they started their, their health investments. When we teach global health, we teach about interventions and interveners and health systems. We think really they're health care systems and we really haven't done justice to the local health department. So essential public health functions have been missing and they're not in this revolution. And part of what I want to do is put them back. So is the revolution over? Um, can U.S. local health departments retool for a non-communicable disease burden? Can they get their budgets off of vaccines and preparedness and onto diabetes and hypertension? I don't know. That's part of what we ought to be doing here uh, at our school. And finally, is there a, a, a place for local public health functions in global health systems? I'm going to skip that and move on to my research agenda for the coming years. I'm motivated by my theory. I like this theory, and I want to be working on my gaps on phi and epsilon, but I also want to work on uh, identifying the best practices in local health department operations and identifying new best practices so that we can measure the gap between the best and the actual. So this last photograph is a picture of the Botswana Ministry of Health. And where you are, there's Melissa. Melissa and Claudia Pereira and I are have a little bit of money from the CDC to go to Botswana and develop a checklist of the essential public health functions that Botswana can use in its districts so we can measure their gap between the best and the actual practices of public health. We'll be doing this in Botswana and Mozambique, and we'd like to, to scale up. Um, it's in our plans for the Qatar School to begin to doing this exercise in, in the Middle East as well. Um, so hygiene. Is the revolution over? Now, I, I think that there's evidence that it's not over, but there's incomplete evidence. And there's a lot on our agenda that we can do to change it. So the answer to the question, is the revolution over, I think, is that it's really up to you. So David, that was a great talk, and uh, I think you win the prize for the coolest slides of anybody. <laughs> so, uh, so I'm going to ask people, I'm sure people have comments and questions to use the microphone because we're, we're taping this, and for David to uh, stay behind the podium. So, so, so uh, I, I can start, but I'm going to over. Okay. So, so Sweden, wh why did you use Sweden as the model? Is it just uh, you, your pay, you know, the book opened to that page, or did it have the most rapid increase in in uh, life expectancy, why, why Sweden? So why, why Sweden? Uh, and the, the answer is data availability. Um, and even if you, I know, I know a lot of you have seen these same slides at Gapminder and Hans Rosling from Sweden. The, the Swedes kept great records in the 19th century. You, you should know that the U.S. didn't begin to collect national data on infant mortality until 1913. And even now, when I sent my poor undergrad to collect state-level data on infant mortality in the US, it's not digitized. Poor Sam had to actually go to PDFs and transcribe the data that we are using. So the availability of digital information on infant mortality from the 19th century is very, very limited. And that's really why we don't have a lot of complete countries. And you can go to Gapminder and start looking for countries with complete records in the, the 19th century, and Sweden's going to be one of the ones where you, you're going to believe the data, the UK, uh, and there's nothing on the US except for, for Massachusetts I was able to find something in the 19th century. So it's really data availability. They weren't writing it down as well as we'd like them to in other countries. also cost those dollars with respect to their particular impact on specific age points and other uh, considerations with respect to infant mortality, prenatal considerations, and the like. 
So, David, that's a great question um, because we, we, we do have data on how they spent the money. What I'm using here is very aggregated. This was when they were filling out the Fed's question of how much should you spend on public health. Honestly, don't know whether they got it all. But there is, a, uh, thanks to the National Association of County and City Health Officials and the National Association for State and Territorial Health Officials, we've actually surveyed and we actually know where they've spent the money. And of course, one of my research objectives in coming years is to do that type of health services research in public health, the way we do it in the clinical services. How does spending on this type of medical treatment lead to the health of, of the, the individual? Again, the research that I'm, I'm going to be pursuing in coming years applies this econometric approach using what mix of services is, is most effective. I think we owe that to uh, our, our state health departments. Um, traditionally, Hopkins has said, look, you know, you folks in public health, you get along. We're going to write these NIH grants and, you know, and, and find great discoveries in biomedicine. We really not. And part of the quiz that you saw, how many of our PhD dissertations have been on health departments in the last 60 years? Four. We don't do that. And, um, Tom Burke is really excited that I got this new religion, so he and I are going to have a lot of fun in the coming years. I was thinking back to those couple of papers that you showed about uh, reducing health disparities by uh, uh, interventions like vaccination, okay? Powerful interventions that have a big effect. Also thinking about the Jeffrey Rose argument about healthy populations, healthy individuals. So what do you think are the new powerful technologies that public health is going to use to reduce disparities and to sort of make the kind of progress that you're talking about? Can you be more specific? Well, you know, I mean, a lot of our students constantly debate whether we should make investments in making people wealthier and reducing income inequality as a tool to improving health, right, or inv investing in um, our traditional water, reducing infectious disease and so forth. So okay, is, so, so I think I get it. So, so part, part of what I, I say when I, what I mean when I say hygiene is having a health officer really d get it right to say, look, I am going to look at the printout of the burden of disease in my city or county, and I'm going to think through the public health problem solving. I'm not going to get wired into just doing what I learned in school 20 years ago. I'm going to look and see what is their burden today. And Oxiris Barbo is looking at that printout, and what is she seeing? She's seeing homicide, and she's seeing heroin overdoses. And by golly, she should do something about those causes of death and not what we may have trained her to do 20 years ago. Um, so it, it is practicing public health and calibrating what you're doing to the, the epidemiological burden of, of your place and thinking it through and making common cause with non-public health people. That's what we've always done. Um, it was recently in India where the burden staring them in the face is car crashes, and yet they are pathetically outgunned with their ability to reach across and make deals with the police to, to solve that burden. So not, we're not angels. We really don't do this practice of public health well. Our gap is large in terms of what we should be able to do in, in local public health practice and, and, and what we're actually doing. But I say that getting it right using this institution and getting that institution to do their job is better than some new thing out of a, of a wet lab. Stan? Uh, thank you. Um, you talked about uh, only four PEs for public health uh, departments or whatever, and you've been around for a while. So uh, given what you taught us, what you told us today, how might you um, say that, that the MPH program or the doctoral programs in the school need to be reoriented? Would you bring in more public health? County public health people or ministers of health from other countries to talk about their problems or how how might uh, the school improve uh, what it's doing? Thank you. Thank you for that question, Stan. Um, the last slide says it. it. It's really up to all of us. Uh, I've not been put in charge of the MPH program. Um, <laughs> but I, I think my talk suggests where the direction that I might try to take it. We really might need to invest in, in, in expertise before we say, come and get it. I don't think we have it as much as we think we have it. We haven't been working in this space. Um, 
and the reasons for that are, are we know those reasons. We know how this school ru runs, and those are the reasons why we haven't been funding our research in this space. But that's changing, and I see the landscape of the future as looking for the value, like my regression showed. How are we going to make our infant mortality go down, guys? We're giving all the neonatologists all this money, and come on, show it to us. Well, I think the type of work that I've been launching on has some of that. You want a great investment, Congress? Go back to your local health department and get that stuff right. So the future might be kinder to public health than the past, where this whatever you do in the lab, let's pay for it, let's get it on the, the insurance agenda. Those days, I think, are not over yet. We're going to launch this massive expansion of insurance funding. But then, as costs escalate beyond 18% of our GDP, those cries for where's the value are going to come back. And I think public health has value. And that's, that's what I, and we'll chase that value as faculty in the School of Public Health. So we'll do uh, one last question and then, then we'll break. Kellogg? Oh, last question. Uh, great talk. Thanks. Um, I'd like to go back to your big stink. And the mm. issue that I see perhaps in the United States is that have we solved the problems because our aging infrastructure, and it kind of reflects back on what the taxes and this idea of economic value, we've taken for granted a lot of these things. And perhaps we're slipping back. And are we at a tipping point at some point about where we're going to go with these basic infrastructures? I'm biased with water, but mm. there's this thing. I mean, if we walk down the street, it's, it's disrupt now, and their sewage is going to back up, and these things. How does that fit into these models of you get success? Do you maintain that success and push forward, or do you have to keep reinventing the wheel, so to speak, every 100 or 150 years with our ability to say, hey, we've taken for granted, but we should not forget how we got to uh, this improved public health. Thanks, Kellogg. Um, it's really a hard sell. We know how hard it is to sell public health. And your point about today, our sewers are outdated and ready to collapse, and yet state and local governments don't want to spend. Well, you know, we think that's a 2012 problem. They had that problem in 1875. Part of public health practice, part of the art not the science, but the art of public health, is political salesmanship, of finding the common cause between the political elites and the people who you need to serve. Now, they were lucky in 1875. They were running on some great politics back then. They had a political progressive movement in their country. We had that in the 20s when we trusted our government to do anything, and we actually let them make alcohol illegal because we trusted the power of the government to improve health. We're in a distrust mode. But the practice of public health includes running politics. And we are supposed to have in our curriculum courses on how the political support for investments in, in infrastructure occurs, even with a Tea Party in your country. We have to train graduates that know how to get around a Tea Party in order to invest in a sewer. It's part of our business in a school of public health. So let's get to it. I mean, they're, they're, I'm not being facetious. There actually is great historical scholarship on how to solve those political problems. And yet our, our students have to really clamor for it. And I was able to run a, a special studies with about five IH students reading through some of the political theory on this. But I was, I'm an economist. I can't do it. Um, and we really are having trouble attracting political scientists onto our faculty and getting them to survive on soft money. I don't know how to solve that. That's uh, above my pay grade. But we need it on the curriculum. And I'd like to see it happen somehow. Well, thank you all for coming. And I think they're uh, <laughs> turning it over to, to Mike. some healthy vegetables and whatever and uh and get to talk to you.